All right, good afternoon. My name is Matt Glover, and I'm a vice chair of this year's symposium. I'm excited and honored to introduce our moderator for this afternoon's panel. Um, Judge Brett Kavanaugh was appointed to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit in 2006. Prior to that, he was a partner at Kirkland and Ellis and served in a number of positions in the executive department, including the Office of the Solicitor General, Associate Counsel in the Office of the Independent Counsel, and as a senior advisor to President George W. Bush. Judge Kavanaugh is a graduate of Yale University and Yale Law School. He was a law clerk to Judge Walter Stapleton, Judge Alice Kaczynski, and Justice Anthony Kennedy. Please join me in welcoming Judge Brett M. Kavanaugh. Thank you, Matt, and good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the Federalist Society panel on the welfare state and American exceptionalism. First, thanks to the Federalist Society and the University of Virginia School of Law for yet another spectacular student, student symposium and for hosting this panel in particular, and thank you all for being here. Now, here's how we'll do this. I will briefly introduce our distinguished panelists in the order they will speak. Each of them will speak for about 15 minutes and we'll have response time and then we'll have questions uh, from the audience. Jeremy Rapkin is professor of law at George Mason University School of Law. Previously was a professor of government at Cornell for some 27 years. He's a renowned scholar of international law, national security law, and early constitutional history. And he'll speak today about the American understanding of the Constitution and the unique feature of federalism in our Constitution and relate that understanding to current debates, including about the scope of the commerce power. Naomi Rao is also a professor at George Mason and is an expert in comparative constitutional law and legislation, among other topics. Professor Rao worked as an associate White House counsel in the Bush White House where she, she and I had the privilege and honor to work together, and she has worked as a counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee as well. It's particularly fitting that she is here today. She once clerked for Judge Wilkinson, who of course has his Fourth Circuit chambers here in Charlottesville, and she clerked for Justice Thomas, who is our banquet speaker tonight. Professor Rao will discuss American exceptionalism in the context of human dignity, and how our constitutional protection for human dignity is rooted in negative rights as compared, for example, to the conception of rights in Europe. Bill Marshall is professor of law at the University of North Carolina. Professor Marshall served in the Clinton White House as a deputy White House counsel, and he's also served as, as Solicitor General of Ohio. He is an expert on a wide array of constitutional issues, including the First Amendment and presidential powers. He'll talk today about the Constitution in relation to the United States' traditional commitment to ensuring opportunity, and will explain that the Constitution, by and large, does not prohibit government from providing affirmative rights. Thanks to all three of our excellent panelists for being here today. Professor Rabkin, the microphone is yours. I like the double microphones. It's, it's like those wartime news conferences, right, with <laughs> CBS, ABC, networks that don't exist now. Um, <laughs> let's, let's start with, um, is the United States an exceptional country? And I just want to point out to you that our enemies think so. Uh, one of the really great moments during the uh, surge of troops into Iraq, um, this mullah notified his followers in Iraq. Well, yes, the Americans seem to be fighting very fiercely in the middle of the day. And that is kind of impressive because it's 115 degrees. 
but they have air-conditioned underwear that is issued to all of their troops, and that is why they are able to fight during the middle of the day, and the her terrorists have to hide during the day. Um, in other words, they believe that Americans have magical powers. <laughs> if you've been watching the news uh, from uh, Libya and various other places where people have been protesting, these enormous crowds, and they're all holding up signs in English. <laughs> Why not in French? Why not in German? I mean, Libya used to be an Italian colony. There actually are a lot of people in Libya who do, they know enough Italian to write a sign in Italian. But it would be pointless to hold up a sign in Italian. Um, they, I mean, no offense to Italy, but um, <laughs> they believe that America has unlimited power and can rescue them. People in Iraq were extremely indignant that we allowed the country to fall into chaos because, of course, with the air-conditioned underwear, we could have saved the country. And it must be that we chose to let them fall into chaos. Uh, I think one thing that distinguishes America from many people in third world countries, less developed countries, is uh, people in those countries believe in magic and think that if we are very successful, it must be because of things like the air-conditioned underwear or some other magic. Um, we should think about what has made us so rich and so powerful and so successful. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about today. Uh, I want to pursue this point about exceptionalism. Uh, that used to be a discussion about why there was no socialist party in America, or there was no socialist party large enough for political scientists in Europe to pay attention to, or political observers in Europe. Um, more recently, this has, and I, I was about to say, well, we don't talk about that anymore, and I think it's partly because one of our major parties has drifted a lot to the left, so it's not so interesting to ask, how come we don't have a socialist party? Um, <laughs> And to be fair, uh, European socialist parties have moved a lot to the right, so the distance between Europe and America doesn't seem so great, but in the last few years we kept having this discussion about, particularly in 2008, how come we're the only major industrial country that doesn't have national health insurance? And th th that was more or less what's wrong with America. Um, what I want to talk about is, since we're no longer the only country that doesn't have national health insurance, uh, how, come we're the, how come we're the only country that is furiously debating whether we should have national health insurance and has half of the country mobilized in resistance to national health insurance. And actually that's kind of interesting. Um, I want to start with uh, political culture because as Judge Kavanaugh said, I used to teach in a political science department. Um, America really does have a different background political culture. I want to just briefly tick off a few things, so let's start with this. Very strong sense of personal responsibility. The uh, Pew Global Attitudes Project, they do these surveys in 44 countries around the world, and every few years they give you different results, and through most of the past decade they were asking, uh, how bad do you feel about President George Bush? Do you really hate him? How much? Do you feel like maybe you don't hate him quite so much? But in between asking those questions, I asked some interesting questions. Um, uh, do you believe that success is determined by forces outside your control? Uh, the results in the United States, 65% disagree, 32% agree. So by two to one, Americans say, no, my success in life is determined mostly by what I do and not by impersonal forces out there. Um, Canada's somewhat close. There's little less uh, disagreement in Canada, but it's comparable. Every country in Europe is flipped the other way. We're two to one saying personal response, per, my personal actions determine my success. In every country in Western Europe, it's two to one the other way. They say, no, of course I can't, uh, it's out of my control. Uh, and I think that tracks with a lot of other things. I mean, a sense of uh, optimism, a sense of discipline. Uh, they ask Europeans, like, what are your impressions of America? One of the things they all agree on, they work really hard. 
And that turns out to be one of our self-perceptions too. We work really hard. Well, that's important because your success depends on you if you think that. Um, here's another interesting thing that's different about the United States. Um, religion. They do these, uh, political scientists, social scientists do these surveys of uh, do you think religion is important? And it's almost a perfect correlation. The wealthier you are as a society, the less important religion is. And so you can draw a perfect downward sloping curve as uh, wealth uh, sorry, as wealth increases, uh, your response to this question about religion is, no, not important. And so it's, it's just like this. And the United States is up here. And we are just an absolutely unique outlier. It's the one country in the developed world where overwhelming majority of people, like 65%, something like that, say, no, religion is very important. Um, Pew had the good idea of asking, uh, do you think that um, America would be better if uh, people were more religious or less religious. And every one of the European countries they asked said less religious, they need to be less religious. Um, people in the United States said we'd be better if we were more religious, we, we, we need to be more religious. So our views on that track perfectly with um, all the Muslim countries which they asked, do you think America would be better if it was religious? Yes! We are really strange in the developed world in that sense, and I think these two things are related. People have very much a sense that both that they have to look out for themselves and that the help they have to look to is not from the government. Uh, there's a third thing that I think is worth um, noticing also that you ask people, uh, do you, are you proud of your country? And again, in America, it's three to one. Overwhelmingly, Americans say, oh yeah, I'm proud of my country. Um, in Europe, it's not so much. Um, interestingly, the country that scores, the only country in this whole survey that scored higher than the United States was South Africa. And, uh, well, they have a lot to be proud of. I mean, they've made a very, very difficult transition reasonably well, and they take pride in that, and good for them. Uh, people in America think we didn't even have to make this transition uh, from this kind of extreme uh, situation in this generation. We, we did it in the previous generation. Uh, but people in America have this sense of, yes, we're, we're, we're doing good. They, they have a kind of background confidence. What does this have to do with healthcare? I think there's a sort of background sense that there's something wrong. First, if you try and make America more like Europe by saying, well, everyone else is doing it, so we, we have to do it. I mean, that doesn't sit well with people. But second, I think people do have really this sense of, no, wait, I have to make my own arrangements. And I don't like having the national government telling me exactly how, how to do this. Uh, I'm not helpless. I don't want to be made helpless. Uh, I have some background confidence that I can do this. Now, I want to say a little bit about federalism, because uh, I think that, that plays into this a lot. Um, there are a lot of states in America. That's to start with something we don't think much about, but it's actually hard to coordinate 50 states as compared to 12 or whatever it is, 11 provinces in Canada and I think 12 lender now in Germany. Um, the coordination problems are harder. Uh, our states compared with states in other federal systems um, have much less role in federal policy. So uh, for most things, you don't directly have to get the consent of the states the way you do in uh, Germany. Uh, we have a long um, history of states pushing back and trying to resist the federal government. And what's most important, and we never think about it, um, we are one of the only countries in which the states mostly subsist on their own revenue. And the amount of revenue which states have been extracting from their citizens and sometimes squeezing it out of people from out of state, um, has gone up a lot in the last uh, quarter century. It used to be about seven, eight percent uh, in the 1960s and now it's about 15 percent. So it's, it's doubled over the last 30 years. Um, over that period, by no coincidence, uh, there wasn't a lot of pushback because the federal government was encouraging the states to do all kinds of things by saying, well, we'll help you, we'll share the costs, we'll pay for part of it, we'll have cooperative federalism. And the point that I want to make about healthcare is we've come to the end of that party. 
in which everybody was toasting each other. By everybody, I mean governors, state officials, presidents, congressmen. They were all having fun together. Now it's not so much fun. And this really does go back to federalism. The states mostly have to raise their own money at home. And it's painful. And it's hard. Because they cannot just print money. And they cannot borrow endlessly. A lot of them have constitutional limitations. And even with creative uh, bookkeeping and even with uh, trying to fool uh, gullible rating agencies, people begin to notice when you have unfunded pensions and other obligations. And so we're getting to the point now where finally we have, like Governor Christie in New Jersey, saying, no, thank you. I don't want this federal assistance to build a new highway from New Jersey to New York. There will be a new tunnel under the Hudson River because we will be stuck paying for it and we can't afford it. And everybody keeps saying to him, wait, no, you don't understand. No, wait, I mean, the federal government's going to help. We're all going to be in this together. Uh, People explaining to him like he's Jefferson Smith, you know, these bills are very complicated. You can't just say no. I mean, I, we, no, we don't ourselves understand. I mean, it just, it has to. Just go, say yes. <laughs> and here we are with health care. We now have 26 states, that is a majority of states, have signed on to these lawsuits saying, no, don't do this to us, you can't do this to us, no, no, no. And a lot of that, some of that, I think, maybe is sort of partisan politics, but fundamentally what seems to be driving that is they're really frightened of being stuck with the bills because the states pay so much of Medicaid and the federal government is saying, no, we're going to help you, but of course we're going to have uh, more people insured, and then, well, they don't get the insurance, well, anyway, but Medicaid. And the states look up and they're really kind of panicked about this and they have reason to be panicked because they have taxpayer revolts everywhere and uh, they have now in many states constitutional limitations on raising taxes, uh, difficulties borrowing, and the federal government is proposing to put a whole new burden on them in the name of some very amorphous thing which most people don't um, support. So now I come to the last point I want to make which is our constitutional culture, I think, encourages resistance. Um, we have the longest continuous constitution in the modern world. People don't think enough about this. I mean, they always talk about, well, the British constitution, it's an old parliament. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights, which is I don't even know what it is. I mean, I teach, I, I teach a course on international law. It's confusing. I don't know. It isn't exactly binding. It's <laughs> something. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights said, no way. We think there's, we think there's a problem that uh, your judicial system, the, the appeal goes through the um, Privy Committee or whatever it's called, the law, the law lords in the House of Lords. And, and that's wrong. That just seems to offend our notion of the separation of powers. So you got somebody from Latvia, somebody from Portugal, somebody from Greece, I mean from countries that didn't have any kind of democracy a generation ago, finding fault with the British Constitution, which is a mere 800 years old. And the British just said, oh, okay, sorry. Oh, well, okay, we'll fix that. So they now have a Supreme Court in Britain, which they never had before. And why? Because the European Court of Human Rights told them that was wrong. Uh, by contrast, we have, uh, jury trials in antitrust litigation, jury trials in all kinds of you know, patent litigation, all kinds of really complex technical civil litigation. We're the only country in the world that does that. We're the only country in the common law world that does that. And people write learned articles saying, you know, actually this is not really so sensible. Uh, we don't even have a debate about this because the Seventh Amendment guarantees it. That's it. It's in the Seventh Amendment. End of debate. Could we change the Seventh Amendment? No, of course not. It's in the Bill of Rights. You can't change that. It's very hard to change our Constitution. Here's the last thing I want to emphasize to you, which is people are serious about constitutional guarantees which courts never heard of. Famous example, the right to bear arms. Uh, this was not invented by the NRA. This is something you can find in political party platforms in the 19th century. People keep talking about this. Congress talks about it. Political candidates talk about it. Took only 200 years for the Supreme Court to catch up to the country on that. Uh, I think there are quite a number of other examples of things that people in the country believed in that this is in the Constitution. It's supposed to be in the Constitution. It's kind of in the Constitution. I could give more examples, but let me just cut to the chase and sit down. Uh, I believe a lot of the country senses that there's just something so wrong 
when the federal government can force you to buy health insurance because you were sitting at home minding your own business. And to say, yes, you, you are affecting commerce by sitting at home minding your own business. You can be unemployed. You can be living in a cabin. You can say, I'm a devotee of Indian medicine and I believe that these charms will take care of me. No, the federal government reaches out because it might have some effect on commerce. I think it's plain to much of the country that there is something really, really strange about the constitutional theory that says, although we have a government of enumerated powers, one of them is the power to do whatever a bare majority totally partisan majority in Congress can get just enough votes to impose on the country. <laughs> so here's my prediction. Uh, one of my colleagues at Cornell used to say, um, used to say, I don't do predictions, that's for journalists, not, not for scientists. <laughs> he became president of the American Political Science Association, of course. Uh, but I will make this prediction, uh, whether there are five votes to say that the health insurance reform plan known as Obamacare is or is not consistent with the Constitution. Um, if they do not have five votes to say it is unconstitutional, um, we will go on debating this for quite a while because there is strong feeling in the country that this is just too, just too outrageous. And the Constitution can't be our Constitution, which is a Constitution for confident people for people who believe they're supposed to be in charge of their own destiny, for people who believe that their prayers can be answered if they do what they have to do, for people like that to be told uh, the government will fix it for you and forget about the Constitution, it doesn't sit well with them, and it won't sit well with them. So this debate will go on, and a lot of it will be framed in constitutional terms, and I think that is a good thing, and it is not something that we should expect can be settled by a mere five justices on the Supreme Court. Thank you. I'd like to um, thank Judge Kavanaugh for his kind introduction and also the Federal Society and the University of Virginia and all of the very helpful students for hosting this fine conference. I'd like to take a little step back um, and, and look at some of the values behind American exceptionalism. Now, American exceptionalism is linked in many ways to our Constitution, which is a charter of mostly negative rights and liberties. There are constitutional limits to how far the welfare state can go, and these are important. But as Jeremy's already mentioned, American exceptionalism in the context of welfare and rights is not related only to the specific provisions of our Constitution. It's also linked to our political and moral culture um, more generally. And our existing constitutional jurisprudence, as we're all well aware, allows for a very wide scope of congressional action. And so it seems that ultimately the more robust limits on our welfare state are going to be social and political ones. How far do the American people want the welfare state to go? And really, we, in me by many measures, already have a quite substantial welfare state. I think we're not as exceptional in this as we, we like to believe. Our welfare state's not quite as lavish as some European countries, but it's still quite extensive. And yet, Americans still continue to debate about debate this. They think about the welfare state differently, even though we're living with it all the time. So what I'd like to do is think about this idea of American exceptionalism with reference to one of the key values of the social welfare state, and that is human dignity. Now, before World War I, debates about the extent of government involvement often referred to values like liberty or equality. And politicians, scholars, ordinary Americans could think about how welfare programs affected liberty and whether they wanted to promote equality of opportunity or greater equality of results. But to a large extent, dignity has pushed many of those more traditional values from the center stage, particularly in countries that have a more extensive welfare state. In Europe, dignity is about being part of the community. It's being protected. It's being provided for by the government. And I think it's very important to understand what precisely is behind this concept of dignity to see just precisely how traditional American values are different. 
So after World War II, many human rights documents, as well as constitutions, explicitly protected human dignity. We see this in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We see it in the constitutions of Germany and South Africa and India. And many of these documents explicitly link human dignity with social and welfare rights. They provide that the protection and support of human dignity requires certain minimum standards of living. It may also require health care, education, fair labor standards, even a clean environment. And in this view, dignity is something that a person, a person needs certain minimum goods just to preserve their dignity. And so in these countries, dignity is not just a, a concept, it's really a constitutional value. It's a value that is set forth and interpreted as a positive right to welfare from the state. And so one can only be dignified with these certain living standards. And if a person cannot or will not provide them for himself, the state and the community will provide these goods for them. And what's interesting here is that dignity isn't just a political goal, but it's a right. And the Supreme Court um, of South Africa has noted in a famous decision, they've said, there can be no doubt that human dignity, freedom, and equality, the foundational values of our society, are denied those who have no food or clothing or shelter. Now, addressing conditions of poverty is undoubtedly a serious matter in South Africa and many other countries where poverty is rampant. But recognizing and recognizing these social problems is in many ways essential towards improving standards of living. But these constitutional decisions are not just about social policy. They take a further step. They say that freedom, equality, and human dignity require removing the conditions of poverty. Now these are, some of you may be familiar with this, these are sometimes called second generation rights. This is not the freedom of being left alone. It's not the human dignity of being a master of one's own fate. Rather, it's something else. It's freedom from poverty. It's the greater equality of social conditions. It's the human dignity of being cared for and protected by the government. Now, as should be obvious, this concept of dignity has a very communitarian meaning. A person's dignity depends on being a part of the political community. And part of community membership means includes certain basic forms of welfare, a certain standard of living. And without that standard, a person has no dignity because they are being placed outside of the community. Now, by contrast, in the United States, dignity has a very different meaning. The American welfare state is not treated as a condition for dignity. Rather, dignity is primarily about negative rights. As Supreme Court decisions have discussed, we maintain our dignity when the government respects our free speech rights, our religious freedoms, our right to remain silent. In the context affirmative, of affirmative action cases, dignity is often referred to as equality of treatment, not equality of outcome. The government respects our dignity when it treats us as equal citizens and doesn't differentiate between us on the basis of our race or our gender. And I think it's fair to say that this is the dominant individualistic conception of dignity that runs through many American Supreme Court decisions. And this should come as no surprise. Um, American dignity simply in this way reflects our history and the traditional relationship between the individual and the government that underlies our constitutional system. We have, by and large, a constitution of negative liberties and rights, not positive ones. So, and when our judges and our politicians protect this form of dignity, it represents a kind of exceptional American perspective. It's a perspective that's found only dimly in other countries, as, as Jeremy also pointed out. Um, in many of these other countries, individual negative liberties often take a backseat to more positive communitarian goals. In many parts of the world, liberal individualism is seen as insufficient for rights. Instead, the rights and dignity of a person come from his or, associa his or her association with the broader society. And I think this difference, now reflected through the rhetoric of human dignity, is one way to understand the exceptionalism of American attitudes towards the welfare state. But I think it would be very naive to suggest that a liberal, individualistic understanding of dignity is the only one in American culture. I mean, the world is not a federal society convention. But, um, 
they're competing understandings, right? Dignity as a type of positive right has made the occasional appearance and oftentimes a, a fairly prominent one. And the Supreme Court has dabbled with this in cases like Goldberg versus Kelly, although by and large it's backed away from a notion of positive constitutional rights. But we can also look to things like President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's second Bill of Rights. In his 1944 address, he presages many of the modern constitutions of the social welfare state. FDR goes to Congress and he states that our traditional political rights, he says, have proved inadequate to assure us equality in the pursuit of happiness. He goes on, he says, we have come to a clear realization of the fact that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. As in many European countries, Roosevelt treats traditional negative liberties as insufficient for human flourishing. Rather, flourishing requires minimum standards of living, and FDR includes a variety of positive rights, including to education, fair wages, and, and a whole list of other things. And, um, and indeed, it was under his watch that much of the welfare, modern welfare state was created. For a more modern example, we can see that President Obama has brought up dignity with regard to regulatory reform. Last month, with an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, he announced his executive order to subject all regulations to cost-benefit analysis. Now, this seems like a laudable goal until you read the fine print. As part of weighing costs and benefits, agencies must always consider, the executive order says, values that are difficult or impossible to quantify, including equity, human dignity, fairness, and distributive impacts. So um, President Obama's executive order doesn't, quite plainly, define what is meant by human dignity, but its meaning might be taken from the surrounding concepts of equity, fairness, and distributive impacts. Whatever else dignity might mean, it's not the dignity of being left alone by the state, but it, rather it's the dignity of considering whether regulation furthers values such as distributive impacts and equity. So one of the difficulties with dignity is that it's not really a traditional legal term. There's been very little debate about what it means. Instead, it's just one of those words that you're supposed to know it when you see it. But dignity often refers to values that conflict. And so despite its lofty connotations, it cannot make a wide range of goods work together. And we can see this in the context of the welfare state. The dignity of individualism, of having the widest scope of freedom, is not compatible with a conception of dignity that requires large programs that redistribute wealth in order to favor the dignity of belonging and community. These values have to be traded off against each other, finding a balance that is both politically palatable and constitutionally permissible. So even within our exceptional American culture, we have a discourse of dignity and welfare rights that is unexceptional. Um, in fact, it's perfectly in line with modern developments in Europe and elsewhere. And so I would like to believe that traditional forms of American dignity, forms of dignity that emphasize the individual and negative liberties, have at least kept a narrow lead in our history. But this need not always be the case. American exceptionalism, this commitment to individual rights and liberties, um, a commitment to the state respecting human dignity by leaving us alone, depends on a political and constitutional culture to maintain it. Exceptionalism is not self-sustaining, but rather it must be reaffirmed by each generation of Americans. And in this way, the Constitution provides a framework, but within it, exceptionalism eventually depends on us. Thank you. Hi, let me add my thanks to the Federalist Society for having me here, to my co-panelists, to Judge Kavanaugh. I, I woke up this morning uh, having lost my voice, kind of ironic that I need some health care right now. Uh, <coughs> uh, but let me add that I, I don't think there's any group I enjoy speaking to more than the Federalist Society. Um, I come from a mixed marriage. My dad was a conservative Republican. My mom was a liberal Democrat. My mom, as it turns out, was smarter, but I still learned how to to talk across lines to people at a very early age, and it's so incredibly important. I learned 
so much from this panel. I've learned so much from the other panels that we've had so far, and I want to give, really give my thanks to the Federalist Society for having me here and to continue this tradition of opening up the forum to all kinds of views. Two years ago, I spoke to the Federalist Society Lawyers Convention in Washington right after President Obama was elected, and uh, I had left the White House, Clinton White House, on the last day of the term, 2001, and felt sort of outside of things for a number of years and feeling fairly optimistic. So I looked out at the audience and I said, I've been there, welcome to the wilderness. <laughs> Little did I think that within two years I'd be back in the wilderness again, but here I am. <laughs> Congratulations to all of you. It is all cyclical. I mentioned it at the time when I said that to the Federalist Society Convention, don't feel too disheartened. It comes around, and indeed it does, um, and that's something to think about too. And, and our views change somewhat. I mean, it is true what Jeff Rosen was referring to last night. Views of conservative judicial power are a lot different now than they were 30 years ago. Views of liberal judicial power are different now than they were 30 years ago. Whether that means everybody's unprincipled, uh, it's one interpretation, or whether it means that you come up with new realizations as you go through time is another question. But that's worth about thinking about as well. This is a great idea for a panel. There's not much law in it. Um, I don't think there's any question. I was going around talking to all my friends here saying, can you give me an argument? Is there an argument that if the United States wanted to provide free health care to every one of its citizens, that would be unconstitutional? And I haven't heard any argument yet. I think that would be pretty well constitutional. The problem with the, with the current bill, if there is one, is the individual mandate, but not the idea that the federal government can provide this sort of benefit. I don't know where a constitutional objection to that would come from. Uh, the question then, then is what I think Professor Rapkin was referring to, is, is the notion that the government would provide a benefit like that somehow inconsistent with our constitutional culture. And the theme of this panel, I think, on American exceptionalism is precisely that, is, is the expansion of the welfare state somehow inconsistent with what, our, with what our constitutional culture is all about. And quite clearly, uh, again, the, the, uh, this, this health care bill has clearly triggered a nerve in the society. It's worth thinking about what it is that has been triggered by it. The individual mandate, I think we can all agree, really isn't the problem. That's not what people are really objecting to. That's the legal hold that they can get on it. What they're objecting to is, now, is federal health care uh, and the idea of a broad amount of services. Maybe some people are just focused on the mandate, but there were a lot of other programs being proposed that didn't involve the mandate. The Heritage Foundation at one point liked the mandate, uh, liked the idea of a mandate. Uh, it's really the idea of should the federal government be involved in a welfare program of this kind of magnitude. So what are the constitutional cultural objections to the United States government, the federal government being involved in that? And I really think there are two. One is what we've heard so far, the sort of notion of rugged individualism and the individual who decides for herself her major choices in life. And a second one, I think, equally powerful is the distrust of government, and that we just don't believe government can do it right, uh, and we're concerned that we don't want to give that much power to government, not because healthcare is a bad thing, but because we're concerned with the way that it might be administered. Now, I want us to, uh, what I'm going to do with my time is try to flush this, flush this out a little bit and then move on to another American constitutional narrative for a moment. Uh, the idea of, of a rugged individual one is a powerful one in our society, and it's a good one, and it's taken us a long way. And there's no question that we have a greater optimism than they do in Europe. I think partly that's as a result of the wars they've had in Europe, by the way. But it's also, I think, a part of just the notion of the people who came here saw optimism and saw the ability of unlimited opportunity, and that's what we teach our kids, and that's what this country is all about. And it, and it served us very well. But it's a complex narrative. Entry costs are a little bit higher than they used to be. You do need much more education to be able to succeed in the society more than you ever did previously because the kinds of professional availabilities out there require so much, so much uh, <clears throat> interreaction and so much, uh, excuse me, so much uh, preparation. It's also more complex now because, because the society is much more integrated. Literally, if I cough today, Somebody from William Mitchell Law School may get that and take it back to Minnesota. 
Uh, there are, there are, there is an interrelation in the society, the way we move, the way we integrate, that, uh, that causes a greater interrelationship. The Commerce Clause has moved in part because the intricacies and the interrelationships of society have changed. It's also a little bit more complex because part of this notion of the rugged individual is that if the rugged individual succeeds, the entire society succeeds. It helps America. It's not so clear in global markets that America benefits from a lot of the economic growth taking place. The Atlantic had a nice interesting um, uh, article a little while ago that I urge you to read about the global elites and the, and the creation of a global class without any particular national allegiance at all. So it's not quite as clear that the United States as a country benefits as much the way it should be. And then there also is the problem of corporate power because so much of the success we're talking about is an individual success, it's corporate success. And if we want to go back and talk about what the framers cared about, they did not like corporations so much. Corporations at that point were chartered, they were frequently monitored, there was a distrust of corporations, they were thought to be soulless, they didn't think that the kind of virtue, we talked a little bit about virtue last night, Nelson Lund did, the virtue that an individual might bring to his profession isn't necessarily there with a corporation which is legally bound to try to maximize profits. So you have a little bit of a temper notion of what this rugged, uh, with what rugged individualism means and the effect that, uh, that that might have in thinking about what we deal with folks who are not as lucky in terms of where they are placed in our American democracy. So how about the second one? How about the second argument, the narrative of distrust in government? I buy that. I grew up in New Hampshire. Live free or die, right? Um, government is too big. I don't think there's any question that government is too big. Where it gets cut, we can see varies a little bit. I'm not sure legal services, for example, is the place to cut. Um, but clearly, um, clearly government has gotten big. In fact, for eight years, I thought, you know, the most dangerous place where it's getting big is presidential power because isn't one person deciding things by himself a heck of a lot more dangerous than 535 people doing it? I still believe that way, although there's a Democratic president. I hope you all feel that way when there's the, when there's the next Republican president. Um, this kind of distrust is healthy. Giving too much benefit to the government to make all of our choices for it is healthy. That said, you have the problem of corporations again. And one thing we know about corporations is that they go to excess. Everybody, you talk about the question of corporate capture. Remember the argument, we don't want regulations because corporations might capture the regulator? Yeah, they do that. They'll do anything they can to make profit. That's what corporations do. It's not that they're bad. It's just that's what they are set up to do. And there are excesses. There are excesses in the environment that corporate, corporations have caused. Uh, certainly the Industrial Revolution that led up to, um, the, the Industrial Revolution ravaged individuals uh, via corporate excess. Who is going to stand up to corporate power? I, I keep going, it was mentioned that I, I worked at Solicitor General of Ohio. I actually believe in state power. I really care about state power. I wish there was more power at the states. We were able to hire our lawyers at $41,000 a year out of law school. That's not very much. We didn't have, when I, when I, my first job out of law school was with the Minnesota AG's office. And we tried to sue one of the major oil companies. We didn't have the resources. States just don't have the resources and tax, and can you imagine somebody running to increase the salaries of state attorneys generals, members of the state attorney generals? Not gonna happen, not gonna happen. The only, the only entity that can stand up to the excesses of large corporate power is the federal government. I don't like it, it just happens to be a fact of life. And, <clears throat> and cutting the corporate, and cutting the federal government means that you're gonna have private power. And one of the narratives that we have in our culture, just as much as we have a narrative of distrust in government, is a distrust of private power. When the cowboy rode into town, he didn't fight for trickle-down economics. He was usually fighting the land gentry that wasn't allow weren't allowing the other people to succeed. So that is another one of the narratives that we have and that I think that we have to, we have to think about. Um, <clears throat> so let me, let, let me take this to, uh, coming to the end of my time, so let me just take this to healthcare for a moment. Um, and the comparison to Europe, I, I think the comparison to Europe is really interesting because one of the reasons that I think Europe is the way it is is because there's a lack of social mobility 
in Europe, and it traditionally has. It's been a much more class-oriented culture than ours. One of the problems that I see that has been going on for the last 30 years is whether we want to admit it or not, we are becoming a more class culture. What was it, 13,000 families got 11% of, uh, of the wealth last year in, uh, in 2007 in income. The ability, the connections of wealth, power, uh, create a caste that entrenches the wealthy. And our upward mobility, according to all studies, has vanished in a way that it hasn't existed in previous years. The GI Bill, which is one of the ultimate redistributive programs ever enacted by the federal government, turned that around in the 50s. We haven't seen anything like that since then. So let's go back to health care, which is something I care about deeply. So you got the right foil here. Um, Roosevelt did talk about it. So did Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon proposed health care. Lots of folks on both sides of the aisle have deposed it. Why health care? Well, it seems to me that health care is essential to freedom of opportunity. Spending money because you need surgery is not disposable income in the same way that other kinds of purchases are. Being healthy is the key to opportunity. Being healthy is the key to upward mobility. Having access to health care is the access to mobility, period. So many people have to stay in their jobs because of fear of losing their health insurance if they have to leave it. 46% of all personal bankruptcies are dealing with, with health care issues. We all, know, we all know people who've had to sacrifice their own education to take care of loved ones or people who had to sacrifice their own education and their own opportunities because they had to take care of themselves because of the accidents of disease or other kinds of trauma. Uh, currently, there are 47 million people in this country without health insurance. 8.7 million are children. If we really care about opportunity, because this is the other great myth, the other great narrative of our society is this freedom of opportunity, which I deeply care about. I do think it's what American exceptionalism is all about. Then at least eliminating the barriers that are caused by things outside of one's control, meaning bad health, seems to me an essential place to start. Thank you so much. <clears throat> without a declaration of war, and his Secretary of State said, you know, we don't need a declaration of war because uh, the UN Security Council authorized it, and they can authorize us to send troops, and then we don't need to have Congress doing anything. And Congress at that time is now, that's gone. Cool. People really sense that, no, that can't be right, that the President can make an unlimited military commitment on the say-so of the UN and no subsequent president on a large military deployment has dared to act without getting authorization from Congress. Now you might say, what difference does it make if we have a declaration of war or authorization for the use of military force, or if the president just does it on his own, and you come right down to it, it's how you feel about war. No, it isn't just how you feel about war, it's how you feel about the way the government is being conducted, which is not just about what it does, but whether it respects certain basic safeguards. There is a real constitutional question here. I think it is a very real question. I, I am willing to grant you that the government, the federal government, has very broad taxing power and very broad spending power. If it wanted to tax everyone directly and then provide federal <coughs> clinics everywhere in the country, I think there's probably no serious constitutional objection to that. But that isn't what it's doing. And I believe the reason why it isn't doing that is uh, actually the country is not so keen on that. So what we're doing instead is this shell game of saying, oh, you've made private arrangements 
Uh, don't worry, those won't be affected, except uh, they will be affected quite a lot. But that's okay, but don't worry about it, because what we're doing here is just, you know, the states will be involved, and existing programs will be involved, and the main thing is just, uh, you have to sign up for insurance. And that is actually a new threshold. That has never happened before, that the federal government has claimed the right to regulate commerce and extended it to its commerce if you just sit at home. As Randy Barnett said, I mean, last night, it, it's not just now saying does, does an activity affect commerce, it's saying that complete lack of activity can affect commerce. So what you've now said is the federal government can deploy a completely unlimited regulatory power. That's a real change. That's a disturbing change. And I think I haven't worked out to my own satisfaction what the constitutional difficulties are here. But I think it's one of the things that bothers people also is the kind of subterfuge and the sort of commandeering of the states to go along. And there can be constitutional issues there. It's not true that this all just comes down to do you care about health care, do you care about it, and I don't care about it. I want to say one last quick thing. Um, the federal government has made a lot of things worse when it comes to people providing for themselves. There's something just bizarre about saying the states will be authorized to limit people's choices to in-state insurance providers. Why? Where did that come from? Well, we did it in the 1940s. Yeah? And what, what, what's that about? If you go back to substantive due process, the first substantive due process case, Algar versus Louisiana, what's it about? Somebody wants to buy insurance from out of state, and the Supreme Court looks at that and says, look, the state has no business preventing people from buying something from out of state. And that was a very sensible decision. It's not Lochner, it's not the height of the Lochner era, it's the first substantive due process case. They look at that and they think, this is so weird, this is so strange, this is really, and what we've now said is, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna cement that in by having Congress, as it seems to me, abuse the power to regulate interstate commerce by saying each of the states will now be its own isolated market. Um, there are a lot of things that we could do to help people get health insurance that wouldn't involve the federal government directly commandeering people and saying you will buy this, you will buy that, and the state will do this, and the other states will do that. Pro Professor Rad, can you acknowledge? I've heard you say that the federal government could just tax everyone and yes. accomplish the same end, even yes. if you were just sitting in your cabin. Yes. And so philosophically, put aside constitutionally, just philosophically, how is taxing someone, commandeering the money, different from well, telling you to well, purchase something? Well, let's start with this. Um, it can tax you. What is it taxing? We don't, we don't have a head tax. We tax something. Well, the first thing we tax is income. You, in your cabin, may arrange not to have any income. And that's not a joke. I mean, there are people who arrange to drop out of the economy, right? Um, you could tax sales of things. You could have an excise tax. You could avoid those taxes by saying, I'm not going to do that. One of the things that just bothers people about this is the federal government saying, no matter where you are, no matter where you try to flee, we will get you and make you buy the insurance. And people just say, well, it just why do you have to do that? Right? When you are going after old Grizzly there up in Montana, you know, <laughs> that, that, that's just relentless, right? That, that's like Wicker versus Filburn, which you know stuck in people's craw. And it's even worse because at least, at least, um, Mr. Filburn was actually um, planting, right? He was doing an activity. This is really saying you could you could be in a coma and we'll still make you buy health insurance. <laughs> Professor Marshall. Oh, nobody's ever called me touchy-feely before, Jeremy. I gotta appreciate that. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, you switch. You s the question in this panel is the American welfare state and how much of it is constitutional or not. There's some ways that are constitutional to achieve it, and there's some ways that are not. What I was trying to address was, what I was trying to address was, is this question of this individualism and this distrust of government, this constitutional culture that you brought up, something that would prevent something like the provision of free health care by the government and the society. The Constitution doesn't do that. Even you admit it. I don't think there's an argument to say that the Constitution prohibits the provision of health care by the United States government. So the question rather is this kind of other notion. The, I, the, the individual <coughs> mandate, I think, is, is one way that they've 
tried to accomplish it their other ways. And that's, that's what I think um, was the focus of my remarks. And this constitutional culture, I think, is a real one. I mean, I think it, I, I think it divides us. I think there, some of us think of opportunity in different ways than other people think about it. But, eventually, but it is a political question at this point, and it's the question of how we perceive that constitutional culture. The individual mandate is a different question entirely. Uh, deal with one specific program proposal as to how to uh, provide health care services. If you will let me take that out of the bill, you can have all of us. I'm not sure everybody else would agree with that. You won't have anything left. The whole bill hangs on this. <laughs> mm. All the insurance companies know that. All the insurance companies went along with this because they were assured that they would get people paying for their premiums. If you say, no, people don't have to pay for the pre premiums, the whole thing mm -hmm. collapses. So th this is not a and then little, little incident. And then there would be other efforts to try to provide national health care. There would be other efforts, okay. and it would be fine for us to debate the other efforts. But the reason, one of the reasons why we have a fixed constitutional structure, or at least relatively fixed constitutional framework, is so politicians don't have unlimited means of fooling us. <laughs> right? Which is, of course, what they try to do. They say, well, don't worry, but just speak it. It's not really, oh, don't, don't worry. I mean, people want, like, what are we talking about? If you're taxing us, tell us. If you are taking control of this and saying, from now on, it's going to be government-delivered health care, and we're all going to have the same high-quality health care that they have on Indian reservations uh, <laughs> provided by the government, tell us mm -hmm. that. But, but you shouldn't be allowed to use subterfuge and work your way to that gradually by, by um, means that really the Constitution doesn't offer us. I think we want to change, which is that um, in terms of the, you mentioned rugged Yeah, again. But then I think if that's true, then I'm not sure to accept the two philosophical principles that you said. Well, well, first of all, I mean, I, the question is, are we talking like basic subsistence payments or something like that? Because they have in Europe a right to a living wage. You know, one question, again, is the question of, of governmental power. But we're not talking about governmental power now, right? We're talking about the sort of notion of constitutional culture. I do think we have conflict in our, contra, uh, in our constitutional culture. We are rugged individualists. We believe that people should take care of themselves. We've also fought wars for other people's freedoms. Most countries don't do that. That's one of the things that's made us exceptional. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm from New Hampshire. I teach in North Carolina. I'm going to turn a little bit on my home state. But we fought a war in this country about fighting for other people's freedoms. We do that. We are One of our great American exceptionalism is our generosity and the way that we reach out and that, part, and that we believe one of, our, one of our driving narratives is that we believe that we're only as strong as our weakest link. So I do think that that doesn't mean, is that inconsistent with the pure rugged individualism? Of course it is. But, but the fact that we have conflicting narratives in our culture is just the nature of culture. I want to follow up on something Professor Marshall said and ask Professor respond, which is you said it's a political question <coughs> we're talking about here, really the limits on the power of government. And that brings out, of course, another strand of Federalist Society conversation over the years, which is what's the role of the courts in enforcing uh, such limits, and isn't there a risk in courts exceeding their role in policing the other branches? And so to what extent should the courts be involved in this conversation? To the extent that there is a constitutional argument that, uh, that the Commerce Clause is being, being exceeded, and I don't think that's a winner, but that's my view, the court should decide it. I have no problem with that. I don't think there should be complete deference on that. I think that uh, you know, the Supreme Court will probably eventually decide it. I think there's an appropriate role for the court to decide the limits of of, uh, of, governmental, of governmental action. I think that's a good idea. What about, Professor Rabkin, the fear of the counter-majoritarian difficulty with the courts on, on a question that's uh, of, of this nature, of uh, government providing uh, rights to people and, and by a 
by uh, a vote of the Congress and the President? <coughs> well, first of all, a bare majority, a totally partisan majority, is maybe not entitled to quite so much deference as, for example, the Defense of Marriage Act, which passed by overwhelming margins in both houses. Right? And that one was just tossed away unilaterally by the President uh, based on magical presidential powers. I, I don't agree with the decision, Jeremy. Okay? Well, I mean, things happen, right? Things happen. <laughs> uh, I would say, uh, first, we should distinguish constitutional questions which have been going to the court since at least Gibbons versus Ogden. I mean, courts have been interpreting the commerce power all the way along. So it's really too late to say, whoa, that's strange judicial activism to have the court pronounce on the meaning of the Congress clause. And second, I would say, um, I think the ultimate, the ultimate issue here is not what five justices, I'm sorry to say, but Justice Kennedy would probably give up five, um, happen to decide is the right answer. Um, this is what the country thinks is the right answer. And the country, you know, it's not focusing on all these little details, but I think the constitutional culture of the country is deeper and more fundamental and in the end more decisive than would you get five justices to agree to. So uh, that wasn't a throwaway line at the end of my speech when I said uh, we'll continue having this debate and some of it at least will be framed in constitutional terms and that is, that is of great importance in itself. So even if the courts, to give a, a contemporary example, um, the Kelo case where the majority of the Supreme Court said Oh, private property, is that in the Constitution? I, no, okay, well, public, uh, so five justices just decided, just decided to, to, to throw away that clause of the Constitution, and there was a lot of strong feeling in the country, wait, this is wrong, this is just wrong, right? So people wanted to entrench in state constitutions, protections, and people made enough noise that I think that's still in play. I mean, even for the Supreme Court, but again, I, it doesn't turn on simply what the Supreme Court says, what the, what the country thinks is really important. And the country can keep arguments alive even when the court doesn't, in your generation, respond to it. People should start lining up for questions, but I also wanted to ask, uh, to ask questions, but I wanted to ask Professor Marshall about something he said, which was uh, about the uh, distrust of government that we uh, that you sense and that the panel talked about, to what extent is that getting worse and to what, it, how can that be fixed or can it be fixed or even should it be fixed? Well, uh, you know, is, are we getting to a, I'm not, you know, historically we've had periods of distrust in government. I think a little distrust in government's healthy. I think, I think Democrats ought to apply it to Democratic administrations and I think Republicans ought to apply it to Republican administrations. What I'm seeing is less of that. Uh, what I'm seeing is more of this is your team. You know, you're either UNC or Duke, and you don't acknowledge anybody that's good on the other side. <laughs> I don't think that's right. I mean, I think that uh, uh, politically one of the interesting things that's happened, I suppose, with the end of the Southern Democratic Party after the Civil Rights Act and the greater polarization of the two parties, you have had the parties not having to work with each other as much as they used to. The, Re the Republicans used to have to work with the Southern Democrats or the Northern Democrats used to work with the Republicans and there, were, there was greater, greater bipartisanship because there had to be to build coalitions. We now really have a two-party system in a way that we haven't uh, for many years, if ever. And I think that polarization is not particularly healthy. And I don't think that when the Republicans do something, it's automatically wrong. And when the Democrats do something, it's automatically right. And I think we ought to have a little bit more nuance in the way we approach those on our side. Yeah, I think, um, I think one of the things that's interesting about our culture of distrust of government is that it, it, it assumes that people believe they can actually change government. They have distrust of government, and they think that they can do something about that. And we saw that a lot with the most recent elections. I remember. When I was living in London, there was a great poll of <coughs> about whether they wanted the euro to come to England. And I think 80% of people in England said that they didn't want the euro. And 80% of people also believed that it would happen. Yes. So um, I think that that type of culture where you really dislike something but you think it may happen anyway or that you believe it will happen anyway because you don't really control what happens in government is, uh, is an important part of um, what Americans believe about their, their Republican government. Why don't we start over here with the questions? Jay? Uh, Jay Schweiker, Harvard Law School. Um, Professor Marshall, I, I enjoyed your speech a great deal. I thought it was very thoughtful and nuanced. Um, I was hoping that you could elaborate a bit on your discussion about Americans 
fear of private power as well as government power. Um, you, you briefly mentioned, uh, you talked about regulatory capture, but to me it seems like that's kind of the heart of the issue, because if we're concerned, as I think you correctly state, about private power and about corporations pursuing their self-interest, isn't that all the more reason to be skeptical of a system in which the uh, you know, corporate treasury, corporate treasury can be added as can be added to uh, protective tariffs and legal barriers to entry and um, all the other kinds of clever things that corporations can do, special exemptions in the tax code. Isn't that skepticism of private power all the more reason to be skeptical of combining it with government power? Well, I mean, I think you need both. I mean, you, you need to, you, uh, there are times when, when there are certain kinds of programs that probably are not good because of regulatory capture, but there are other ones like environmental regulation, for example. There's not much incentive on corporations to automatically clean up the environment. Um, it's, not, it's not particularly profitable. They don't generate much goodwill on that. You need an outside, you need, you need an outside uh, regulatory agency to be able to regulate it. I, I think it, it depends on the area that it's in. We could debate about securities regulation. I know there was a lunchtime talk on that, but it, you know, we could debate on whether the type of regulation is one in which capture creates more problems than it, than it, uh, than it solves, and there may be and probably are some of those, but there's certainly a number of them in which you can't really anticipate that a corporation working for a profit motive is going to take care of the larger social good. Want to go over here? You asking, you asking me? I'm not sure those would be the two cases that I would use to, to illustrate the Supreme Court not doing its work well. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I, might, I might have a few others in mind that, uh, that I'd place instead of that, that one. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I think, the, I think there's, some, there's some cases that I agree with and some cases I don't. It's that simple. I do think, by and large, judicial independence is a good thing. It's going to lead to results that I don't always like. It's going to sometimes get some results that I do like. Um, I think... Uh, we, we will be lost as a country if we put all our chips on the Supreme Court protecting us, or, or even the lower federal courts. Although they're proud. <laughs> <laughs> Go over here. And you're talking about how the Constitution doesn't um, restrain the approval of a health care bill, but neither does it approve it or give you know, reason to have one. And I was thinking part of American exceptionalism, I think, is our ability to take care of other people, our philanthropy. And what didn't come up in the, I know we're talking about welfare in the Constitution, but what I didn't hear in the Minnesota should have spoken about it was the use of philanthropy in helping people in health care in the welfare state in general. And my question is, <coughs> of all of you, do you think as Americans we can take care of our own people if we decide to through philanthropy? Okay. Okay. I guess I, I'll respond to that. I mean, I think that um, philanthropy is more likely to flourish when you have smaller government, right? You have lower taxes and people have more of their own money to spend on philanthropy. So I think that, um, I think our philanthropic tradition is very much consistent with all of our other views of traditional limited government and individual. I also think there's a kind of honor to uh, taking care of your community. I mean, if you look at hospitals, you just like look at the names. Um, quite a lot of them were built by uh, either churches or religious denominations or anyway, people associated with a particular religion and they, they make that the name of the hospital. And that's a way of saying, here we are helping the community. And we're, we're, we're proud to do this because we know that the community needs people like us to help. The more you say, ah, oh, the government will take care of it, the, the more that those efforts seem to be eccentric, peripheral, not so important, 
And I, 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 it's not my view that the government shouldn't do anything. Um, it's not my view that um, everyone should just take care of themselves and it doesn't matter. But it, it is, I think you're very right to raise this point. And it's something you didn't mention that I think is also really important. When you look at figures of how much money do people um, donate to charity, not, not millionaires, but just ordinary people. Um, Americans give more to charity than people in other countries. And I believe part of the reason for that is it's our tradition. We kind of expect that, well, you have to do this, because otherwise the country would be in a really bad situation. And people in Europe think, well, no, that's the government's responsibility. Right? And you lose something if a whole society moves in that direction. You lose something really important. Agree with all of that. The problem, however, is a lot of communities do not have the charitable basis to give. I mean, one of the one of the people have a tendency to give in their communities. Corporations will give with their home offices. It's one of the reasons why it becomes a little bit problematic that corporations are moving overseas and you don't see that kind of charity taking place in the home area. But you take you know, a small town in southern Texas, there really isn't a, a likely charitable source there to take care of that. I mean, people will again probably fa favor charitable giving. It seems to take place in people's own communities, so you're going to leave out a lot of communities. But certainly it's a major part of what we, of, of who we are. It's one of our great virtues. Professor Rabkin, I want to interrupt with a, with a question, which is uh, to flesh out whether the objection you're identifying is rooted in federalism or is rooted in objection to government power. So if 50 states all enacted their version of the health care bill, the, Fed, the national bill was repealed, and all 50 states identify, uh, enacted <coughs> their own version. Would you have objections to those state laws in the same way that you do to the national law? Very much less. Very much less. Uh, and one, I mean, just as if you hang this on the Commerce Clause, of course, then. It's not a problem. Right. I'm just say, I'm saying but, philosophically. But, but, but yeah. Philosophically, I, yeah. you know, let me confess, I'm not a libertarian. I don't like Ayn Rand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not just that. I, it's not just that. It's not just that I'm not enthused. I mean, I think it's a little creepy. <laughs> hmm. I, I, I think we need to be making uh, compromises. I, I mean, I, what, one thing which. I, I, so let me, you keep saying you agree with me, let me say I agree with you. It's bad to have the country as polarized as it is. And one reason why I think it's really helpful to have constitutional norms is it reassures people. It reassures people that, well, things will never go too far one way, way or the other, and I think that's really valuable. Um, I, I think if you have, if you leave 50 states to do different things, it isn't just that they'll be learning, as people were saying on the previous panel, I think it's also reassuring to people, because if you could see that a lot of states did this, then people think, well, that kind of, it's a trend, maybe, I mean, it kind of makes sense. One of the things that bothers people about the way this was done, which I realize is not quite a constitutional point, but is at least related to constitutional culture, uh, we've never before had such an enormous undertaking as this passed by a totally partisan majority. And there's just something disturbing about having one-seventh of the GMP suddenly now taken over by a, a bare partisan majority. If, if you had 12 states, 20, 32 doing this, I think people in the remaining states would say, oh, I don't know. I feel this way about gay marriage, which I think is very likely a bad idea. But I, I don't think there's any constitutional objection to Massachusetts doing it, and a few other states are doing it, and if it turns out that 37 states are doing it, I think people will find it very hard to oppose because they have the sense that these are like concurrent majorities. And that, that, that seems to me to have weight <coughs> to it as a sort of quasi-constitutional way of making controversial decisions. Right? E even though I admit that uh, I might personally be still a little bit squeamish about the mandate, it makes a difference how you get there. <laughs> next, next question. Isaac Madison, Western New England. Uh, to what extent do you think we've already suffered the moral hazards of to rugged individualism as part of American ex exceptionalism through allowing third party payments by <coughs> employers under the tax code that are subsidized, thereby subsidized by the government? Aren't, aren't we already seeing those hazards taken away with the system we have now? If you don't mind. I, I wanted to object to the term rugged. <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessary to be rugged. You could just be reasonable. 
<laughs> you could just be prudent. You could just be cautious. And I, I, there's nothing wrong, I, to my mind, with people taking into consideration when they decide, should I take this job, should I take that job, or should I stay in this job, to think about the various benefits. I mean, I do think it is crazy that you, it's so hard to get insurance or insurance in a larger pool on your own, and there are all kinds of regulatory restrictions which should be removed. But I don't see any objection in principle to agreeing to take a job in which the employer says, and in addition to this and this, we'll offer you health care. I mean, that's okay. It is an expense. There's no doubt it's an expense, and people do need help. Uh, there, insurance is a very good idea, and I don't see why there can't be health insurance in the, provided by your employer along with various other kinds of insurance. I, I, you know, accident insurance, people should get accident insurance, of course. Right? There's a lot of kinds of insurance. It seems to me if you really start obsessing about ruggedness, you'd be saying no one should get insurance. But that is totally crazy. I'm just saying the government shouldn't mandate a comprehensive scheme which everyone in the country is kind of pushed into. And, uh, different people have different needs when it comes to health care. Different people have different needs when it comes to insurance or how cautious they are, how risk averse they are. And, there are not just two possibilities. Either you stand totally on your own or you submit to the state. Right? We're, we're a big country. We have 50 states. We could come up with a lot of alternatives and let people choose. And in the act of choosing, they wouldn't even have to be rugged. They could just choose. <laughs> Hi there. Um, my name is Christina Hosenfeld. Um, I wanted to say first off that I really appreciated the talk by Dr. Marshall. Um, so I guess I'm sort of outing myself as a liberal. So we can go hang out by a <laughs> <laughs> um, This comment is to Dr. Rabkin, I think. You said a couple key phrases um, in your talk. One was inactivity and one was shell game. Um, health is fairly intrinsic. And so just sitting here, we're being inactive. But ultimately, unless you know, you live in this world where you don't actually need health care, at some point you're going to go to the doctor. Um, if you don't have health insurance, you may end up in the emergency room and ultimately you may not be able to pay for that. Say, I break my leg. So those costs are going to get passed on to the taxpayer. So isn't the shell game really that we're now creating something, this individual mandate versus not actually seeing the cost but having to incur them anyway? Look. I, I am by no means saying um, in 2008 everything was great with American health care. Don't, we shouldn't have touched any aspect of it. It was perfect. I mean, it, it was dysfunctional in all kinds of ways and a lot of sensible reforms. Um, the, the two things that bother me, and now we are moving away from constitutional issues to just sort of what, what, what bothers people. Uh, I, although I think they're somewhat related to constitutional issues. Um, the, 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 the first is, um, I think people would have been much more receptive to saying uh, you need to have accident insurance or uh, crisis insurance. And one of the things that's really, I think, provoked people about the, the mandate is it's so comprehensive. I mean, you, you have to sign up for insurance that covers a whole range of things, most of which don't have to do with accident or emergency or even severe illness. And wh why? Why? That's not the emergency room story that you're telling, I don't think. And the second thing is, um, it was important to selling this that, that, that Democratic leaders and President Obama said, um, you can keep the insurance that you have. Well, no, actually, you can't keep the insurance that you have because they've layered all kinds of controls and regulations. People who had insurance, which was most of the country, and were reasonably satisfied with it, they weren't a burden on the, um, <coughs> on the um, uh, emergency room uh, of local hospitals. So if you want to tax them to, to improve service in emergency rooms, uh, okay, let's talk about that. But instead, you, we were told simultaneously that you can, keep the, you can keep the insurance that you have, and everyone is going to be included in this. And the government will regulate the terms of uh, insurance. So that made people feel that it was a shell game, which I think was a correct feeling. Sorry. What you're saying is that, is that people who don't insure are, in effect, self-insurers. And so the regulation is, in fact, of the insurance industry. That's what it is, including people who self-insure. I think that's the easy, simple economic explanation for what it is, and I think on that basis the Commerce Clause argument 
uh, survives. Um, I understand there are a lot of people who disagree, but I think that's pretty much what it is. That they are at they, even if you don't buy insurance, you are a self-insurer. You are participating in the in the in the system, and that's you, the simple answer. You you admit that um, a year ago we were told there couldn't be any objection. In the meantime, we've had two federal district judges saying, "No, wait, there are real serious constitutional problems." So the constant. I mean, one admits, I'm not saying it as a challenge you person, I mean, right? The constitutional issues turn out to be not frivolous. I think there's a serious debate going on on this particular issue. I think the Commerce Clause issue, I mean, I understand the point of it. I think the point you made it very well yeah, as to why it is. <coughs> totally right. We'll see. You know, earlier you said that you were not called touchy feely, but I think she's touching you. <laughs> I teach defamation if you want some assistance afterwards. It's not a <laughs> 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 uh, Sean Sandalowski, Yale. This the last conversation actually touches um on the question. Yeah, how do you how do you feel about it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Professor Rappin, I understand your sort of popular constitutionalist a la Rita <coughs> Siegel and Bruce Ackerman argument against the health care bill. But I'd like to hear how you square this argument with the fact that it meets bicameralism and presentment clauses, and also how it squares with the uh, court's commerce clause precedent, uh, Lopez and Morrison accepted. Um, and then <coughs> I, I'm particularly interested in hearing how the panel feels the decisions of the lower courts, particularly um, Judge Hudson in Virginia, squares with the court's precedent as well. He was asking you about that. I'd like to hear all three. So you want us to talk about law? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, <laughs> law? <laughs> uh. Okay. okay. Um, so well, I guess just to the bicameralism and presentment point, I think. Um, you know, I think what Jeremy was saying about the fact that it was just a bare majority, I mean, obviously it still passes constitutional muster, right? If you have a majority, you have a majority. It goes through Article 1, Section 7. It's still a law, right? Um, and so then I think the objection is not one about, um, you know, how that affects its constitutionality, but how it affects the perception. And then there's, I think, a real question about whether the court should care about that, right? There was somebody mentioned earlier that, that the court, um, if there's a problem when the court is striking down things that people want um, or that are popular, um, I'm not sure that the court should necessarily be taking those things into account. I mean, the popularity of the court. I, mean, I think the lower court decisions are wrong. I mean, that, that's my quick answer to it. I do think the argument we talked about a moment ago that you're regulating economic activity, this is one of the largest parts of our economic sector. Uh, you can call it an activity if you want, but it really is self-insurance. I don't think this is a particularly dramatic move from what it has been previously, but you know, we're, we're watching a fascinating time here. I mean, I'm not a big fan of popular constitutionalism in the Larry Kramer sense of the word that constitutional meaning should follow uh, popular movements. But whether it is or not, w you know, we can watch and see what happens. This would not have been a difficult case 10 or 15 years ago in the same way that it is now. I think it is a fair challenge to ask what is the precedent for this, where the Commerce Clause has been used to force people to do something from a state of complete passivity and inactivity. And I've not heard anyone come up with an example of, forget about even a Supreme Court decision endorsing it, but just even a federal law that does it. <coughs> I think we have never done this before. Registered for selective service. No, Cong that's not the Commerce Clause. Congress has the power to raise armies. That's a separate okay. constitutional power. Okay. But under the Commerce Clause, I think there is no example of this. And that's kind of interesting. We have a government doing everything all over the place all the time. And somehow, even you know, in the New Deal and the Great Society and Nixon and all of these things, nobody went there. So I think we have crossed the line. And I think it is good for people to mobilize over the last lines left. I mean, if you want to say this is an exercise of the Commerce Clause. If you want to say it's taxing and spending, OK, that's a different debate. But as an exercise of the Commerce Clause, I think it is literally unprecedented. And um, that should give people pause. To follow up on Mr. Sandilowski, uh, Professor Rabkin and Professor Rao, 
Your law school, of course, is named for a person who objected to the original Constitution primarily on the ground that there was a necessary and proper clause that Mr. Mason believed would lead the federal government to having all the powers that the states at the time had. And we haven't really mentioned the necessary and proper clause here, but do you want to at least uh, address that before we go on to the next student question? Just to say briefly that they have a debate about this, right, in 1788. And even Hamilton, who is, you know, at the convention, said, we, we, we all know we would just abolish the states if we could, because they're, they're pointless. But even Hamilton says about the necessary and proper clause, um, this has some meaning. It is, that is, it has some meaning as a uh, limitation on federal power. It is not true that, um, this is a completely open-ended blanket license to the federal government to do anything at all which it thinks might be necessary. Um, it's got to be proper, mm -hmm. and it's got to be proper in serving the actual power or implementing the actual power that it's claiming to be um, necessary to. Again, I mean, what if you say that the commer that the regulation of commerce reaches this far, you are saying the necessary and proper clause is a blank check, that it's just free associated. I, I, the challenge, I think, should be on the other foot, which is can you now name, if you think that this is constitutional, any federal law which you would say confidently no, that would be an abuse of the commerce power. That would be too much. Lopez. <laughs> Gun-free schools? <are> you <laughs> I mean, as, as, was said, as was said by the dissenting <laughs> judges and was said in subsequent congressional hearings, uh, you know, uh, students are constantly being distracted by gunfire out there, or at least they think it's gunfire, or they worry that there might be gunfire, so they can't study, and since they can't study, their uh, grades suffer, and since their grades suffer, the whole economy is dragged down. I mean, it's totally clear. Well, well you understand the mandatory... <laughs> The mandatory gym requirements that uh, Attorney General Cuccinelli is talking about would violate the free exercise clause. Can I just point out uh, that Attorney General Cuccinelli is a graduate of George Mason, mm -hmm. <laughs> and therefore I have a lot of confidence in him uh, the right thing. Next question. Manera Alpuhade from Florida International University. My question is directed at all the panelists, in particular Professor Rapkin. I would like to know whether you think the ongoing health care litigation will lead to Wicker v. Filburn being overturned. I think not, because I think that the challenge has been framed in a way that doesn't require that. If it required that, right, the distinction is that um, uh, Filburn, I am right that Filburn was the farmer, right? Yes. Yes. So Filburn uh, was actually engaged in an activity, and he was actually <coughs> engaged in a commercial activity, although in this aspect of it he was consuming it on his own, but it was part of a larger activity. And a line has been drawn here, which, I mean, I don't think it's like the central point of American constitutional law, but it is a line, and not a, I think, frivolous or silly one between activity and non-activity. And so uh, I think the court to start with is likely to, if you can imagine it getting five votes, which let's start with four votes. I think to get up to four even, well, Justice Thomas probably is ready to, uh, he is ready to overturn Wickard versus Filburn, that's one. <laughs> um, I'm not sure we're gonna get up, maybe we'll get up to two, I, I don't think we'll get up to four, let alone five but I do think this constitutional challenge has some plausible hopes because it, it isn't asking them to overturn Wicked versus Over, but that could be next on the agenda. Uh, Johnny Obar, University of Idaho. Uh, this is my question. The, uh, the Amish filed a lawsuit against the federal government back when Social Security was implemented, which got them granted an exemption. And that exemption, they cited, so the Amish do not pay Social Security, nor can they collect it. Um, my question is, they, they cited the Open Timothy 1-5, uh, if any provides not for his own, uh, it's worse than an infidel and have denied the faith. And so to them, um, basically providing for your own means that you have to provide for those in the community, that you have a religious duty 
to provide for your own. Um, would you support, I guess this would be for Professor Marshall or anyone who would like to answer it, uh, what if you know, most Christianity in this country decided that to interpret that scripture as you know, that, that particular, would, would you support a religious exemption to uh, health care? Well, United States versus Lee went the other way around, didn't it? On, on exclusion from Social Security? I thought U.S. versus Lee rejected I think that's right. the Amish. Required to pay Social Security. Yeah, they rejected the Amish challenge. I, Under U.S. versus Lee, I'm pretty sure. No one gets to escape the long arm yeah. of the tax collector. But I may, be, yeah. That is absolutely sacred. They were, they were allowed uh. to stay out of uh, schools because that's not so important. Uh, it's not a U.S. Supreme Court case, right? Uh, well, I, I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I will retire. Well, uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, those, the Supreme Court decisions dealing with the Amish focus very much on how unique the Amish community is in terms of providing for themselves. So it's hard to imagine that any of those precedents, even to the extent they're still good law, would be extended to a broader religious community that would claim an exemption. Hard to follow that, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Stephanie Fleischer from William Mitchell, and uh, despite uh, Professor Marshall's comments, I'm going to try and go back to Minnesota without meeting you. So let's hope for that. It's um, a great school. The panel specifically, um, since we've been talking a lot about the constitutional mandate in, or sorry, the the, the personal mandate in the in the new health care law, um, I have a question: Really, is and or should there be a fear that this kind of expansion for what someone can do or for what the government can require you to do when not participating <coughs> could be expanded just within the healthcare, for instance, to no longer allowing a refusal for care, which the Supreme Court has now already upheld that in, in some instances refusal to, uh, to health care is acceptable. Is there, and or should there be a fear that this will expand into that region and overturn that decision? <coughs> <laughs> I, you're talking about, I mean, you, you're talking about a Supreme Court right to refuse, I mean, a constitutional right to refuse medical care? I don't think that, I don't think this affects that. I mean, this is the Commerce Clause issue, whether the federal government has the power to, to create a law. I think the question of whether or not somebody can refuse medical services, medical assistance is bound up with a number of other individual rights clauses. Okay. I'll go for it before you return to Minnesota. <laughs> I, I think this, I don't know enough about this, and I'm open to being reassured if someone can explain to me, no, there's a very clear line, they'll never cross this line. But I do think that is one of the things in the background that is making people uneasy, which is people want to have <coughs> confidence that they have a, professional relationship with their doctor, and the doctor is prescribing what the doctor thinks is the proper thing for them. And I realize, yes, insurance companies in the background are kind of squeezing doctors a little bit, but you could change insurance companies. <coughs> and I think it is part of people's unease about this, which again, I, it's not a strict constitutional argument, but it relates to constitutional culture. I mean, people feel this is a relationship between the patient <coughs> and the doctor, which the government shouldn't be, I mean, yes, there's going to be some background controls such as licensing, but the government shouldn't get too much involved in this, and especially shouldn't get to the point of telling doctors, you can't do this procedure because it costs too much, and people do really worry about that. And the people who say, oh, no, you don't have to worry about that because they're not doing it yet, that's not extremely reassuring to me. And I'm not sure they're not doing it yet, by the way. I mean, this thing hasn't been implemented. <laughs> this question's for the panel. And I'll, uh, my, my name is Matthew Kimberlin. I uh, attend the University of Virginia School of Law. You're the host. Come on over to the apartment later. Make <laughs> 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 <Thanks> some snacks. Uh, <laughs> Take home some diseases. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's, let's bring some babes from William Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I want to I preface this by, by saying that uh, I, I would imagine that most of us in this room and, and that belong to this society would, would agree, and, and perhaps many that, that, that don't would also agree, that uh, many Supreme Court decisions uh, go far afield of or even uh, bring in ideas that are antithetical to 
the, the meaning that the Constitution was intended by Lance Springers to have at the time of its ratification. And so I'd like you to answer this not in pragmatic, but in, in I guess, in, in ideological terms, in terms of what you actually believe regarding the, the meaning of the Constitution. Uh, one of the things that, that bothers me about the, the health care issue is that uh, we talk a lot about the Commerce Clause, but it's specifically, it's specifically interstate commerce. And, and we kind of give that short shrift, I think. And, and being that health insurance is, to my knowledge, the only widely available, universally legal product that cannot statutorily be bought across state lines, and given the fact that only a very, very small percentage of healthcare services that are paid for by insurance or that aren't are done are, are done in states where those people do not live. That's a fair. It happens, but not as a large part of the healthcare pie. Given those things, how do you feel about just the general regulation of healthcare on the national or health insurance on the national level, vis-a-vis -vis interstate commerce? I feel strongly about it. <laughs> Let me start. I mean, uh, the McCarran-Ferguson Act, which imposes this, which, which allows the states to keep people imprisoned within the state market, I have great difficulties understanding how that is a constitutional exercise of the congressional power to regulate commerce among the states. Um, when I proposed this, um, to uh, Randy Barnett, he said, no, I don't, I don't see that problem. And then I remembered he himself told me that he'd been in some discussion in Capitol Hill and somebody said, well, a senator said, well, what about Social Security? And he said, well, I don't really think the Social Security, and somebody else there said, Randy Barnett has no problem, there's no problem. <laughs> and then I realized, you know, I am willing to rise above Randy Barnett's hesitation and, and um, reticence. I, he just gave away something really basic there, which he shouldn't have. I mean, he did it in private, but um, I, I want to go back to that. I, I think there is a real problem with Congress doing this. And even if you say there aren't five votes on the Supreme Court, I haven't discussed this with Justice Thomas yet, so I'm not sure there's one vote, but I, I think this is, this is really abusive for the Congress to say, we're going to use our power to regulate interstate commerce to divide the country into 50 state markets for no good reason at all. I, I, that seems to me the opposite of why Congress has the power to regulate interstate commerce, and that really shouldn't be allowed, and people should make a lot more complaint and protest about it. I mean, it's, there's just something crazy about it. And I do think that it would make an enormous difference. I mean, this is not some abstract legalistic point that law professors like to debate to make, I mean, this would, this would make an enormous <laughs> I wasn't. I was, of course, not referring to your points when I said that. So I, I, I think that we should we should agitate that question. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to yield my time to Randy Barnett to answer. <laughs> Really? We, only, we only have one more time for one more question, so I think we should go to the back okay. of the line. <laughs> come to the party after. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I like the way that Jeremy said that. I said that in private, and I, my response was, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to clarify, this was last night at the reception. Uh, Jeremy cornered me. <laughs> and he asked me this question I've never given any thought before. Is the McCarran Ferguson Act constitutional? Um, and frankly, I've given this you know, really no serious thought. I did not say it was no problem, Jeremy. I just wanted to. Uh, are that. you with me now? Uh, I, what I said was. <laughs> <laughs> what I said was is that uh, it's no part of this litigation. Oh. And that's what I said. And I said that uh, uh, and because McCarran Ferguson, because Southeastern Underwriters is not in play, and McCarran Ferguson is not in play, and so it's not any part of this litigation. And there's all kinds of things that I would want to see reversed as unconstitutional. This may end up being high on the list at some point. Uh, all I said was, I just wanted to clarify for uh, thousands of people in this room that, that I did not say that the McCarran Ferguson Act was, quote, no problem. The, the, only reason the, I got the, the, the expression, the, ex, the expression of uh, Richard Epstein 
which I think you misquoted yesterday. He said, there are many statutes, there are many statutes which cry out for uh, judicial action to, to uh, overturn them. You don't even have to say this one cries out. <coughs> but would you acknowledge that it's at least beckoning? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let, 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 let me try to shift back. Since there seems to be so much demand here to talk about the health issues, I think there was a structural mistake in not having a panel on the individual mandate, as it turns out based on market demand. But let me just suggest uh, uh, that there are many, many contributing factors to the I would really agree with what you said, that healthcare delivery wasn't wonderful in 2008, and that there was, it was so wonderful that we couldn't touch it. There are many, many distortions. Some of the students have already recognized some of those. For example, third-party all-you-can-eat health insurance. I mean, if you had third-party all-you-can-eat food insurance, you'd have more weight problems than we have today, and, and the whole food industry would be thrown off, where you don't have to look at what a check costs, because some third party is going to pay for your insurance, for, for, your, for your food. I mean, you're going to have a huge distortion of cost. That huge distortion of cost is going to raise the cost of this health third party insurance to the point where young, healthy people who cannot afford, who, who have other things to do with their lives, they might be willing to pay a small amount for a catastrophic coverage so they don't have to burden the health insurance. The, the emergency room if they ever get there, but they don't want to buy this inflated third-party insurance that's already been inflated by these costs. Not to mention the fact that, as some student has already mentioned, you have this tax subsidy to have your insurance provided for you by your employer. And that means, and that gets to uh, Bill's point, that when you change jobs, you fear you have to change your insurance providers, which you don't have to do with your car insurance, you don't have to do with your life insurance. And then if you do happen to have gotten sick while you were insured, while you actually paid the money for insurance, now you're stuck in your job, because you can't switch insurance policies. There's no reason for that. That was created by the federal government, again, in the 1940s, uh, when they decided they had raising price controls and they couldn't give you a raise, so they gave you health insurance instead. Thank you very much. Uh, so there's one after the number. And McCarran Ferguson may be another one. High on the list. You can't buy this product across state lines. Why not? Uh, so for all of these reasons, there's all kinds of what, 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 what needs to be done, what needs to be shown, is that there are market-based and fully constitutional measures to address the health care business, there is no way an individual mandate is either necessary or proper to effectuate that. So, so you are coming to that party? Which party is that? I go to any party that you're at. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think everyone in the room can understand why. <laughs> I think we uh, have to end there. Thank the panelists.